Search and rescue process continues this morning in Surfside. We are digging deeper into a possible cause. What could have caused the part of that condo to collapse? Asher Cohen is a professional engineer with U.S. Forensic on the ground right now in Surfside. Joining us via Zoom, Asher, good morning. Thanks for being with us. Good morning. How are you today? Can you can you explain to us um, what you're doing in Surfside? I, I'm currently about 10 minutes away from Surfside and um, but this is an area where, you know, I've been working here as a professional engineer since around 2006 and um, started working in tall buildings. And uh, now we work in forensics. And one of the things that I know the teams that will be assembled will be doing is just piecing together all the data that they'll be collecting design drawings. They'll be collecting uh, maintenance logs. Clearly, you guys have uh, reported on the uh, the work that had been be, uh, been undergoing for the 40 year certification, which is something that gets done uh, starting at the 40 year mark and then every 10 years following. Uh, as they start to understand, you know, collecting all the information that they had, and of course, as they pick through that rubble, it, it'll be more and more clear. A lot of people have different opinions as to what's going on right now, but it's important that we understand that until we start to really dig out and take a look at these structural components. I think we're going to start to uncover some, you know, more clarity as to what uh, what happened there. So, Asher, uh, and and we're going to roll this video while we speak, and I'm sure you have seen sure. the collapse. It it, it is yeah. jarring to our viewers. We want to warn them, but but based on the video that you have of the that you have seen of the collapse, first the middle section and then the second, are you able to glean anything from that that tells you what happened? There's a number of things that we look at. You know, I, I'd like to tell you that there's things that, you know, stand out. One of the things that you'll notice is that that surveillance camera that collected that video, that one right there that we're looking at, uh, you can clearly see how that central section there uh, comes down. And then obviously the beach side section comes down just after that. One of the things we look at is structural support. You know, uh, obviously I'm sure it's been reported on and a lot of people are going to talk about that this is a coastal structure. So we talk about corrosion of reinforcing. We also talk about when the building was built. 1981. Um, this was before, you know, the, the current code is, is is very vastly different from the from the code that was in existence in 1981, and obviously pre Hurricane Andrew, uh, when a lot of stuff was you know upgraded. But what we look at is, you know, the method of failure oftentimes is not one thing, but a combination of factors. And and one of the things that I think we're going to see is this is likely. I'm not. I'm positive about this, but likely what they call a post tension system. And one of the things important to remember about post tensioning which is a way that they reinforce these buildings in, nowadays, is that you, you have thinner concrete slabs uh, and thinner and smaller elements uh, made possible by this, uh, the advent of post-tensioning. But the problem with post-tensioning is when you have failure of a slab, for instance, if, if it was the roof slab that in fact failed as they were doing maintenance up there, or even if it was a lower level slab that had, uh, it, you know, seen some ex uh, significant amount of corrosion or deterioration from what I'm hearing is uh, some moisture intrusion that had been occurring, which is not uncommon. A lot of these buildings um, do need uh, maintenance over the years. And uh, it, it's not likely that, you know, a lot of the buildings that are, you know, much older than this are going to undergo a catastrophic failure. So when we talk about modes of failure, it's it's going to be likely when we find out what's going on here as, as they pick through the rubble that there's a confluence of factors, a number of factors that contributed. But looking at it, it could very possibly have been that one slab failed. And we saw, unfortunately, with the World Trade Center is that, you know, when you have a slab failure, um, it, it imparts a significant impact load uh, as as it starts to collapse. And, and we saw that in the video uh, that once it happens, it's a domino effect. So Asher, and, and unfortunately, yeah. yeah. And, and so we know uh, from a, a report yesterday uh, that there was a, a researcher from Florida International University who was doing some right. research on, right. on on sea level rise and, and came right. across the fact that the condo had a, a subsidence rate of of about two millimeters, meaning it was sl sinking very, very slowly, uh, built over wetlands. Could that be a factor? Well, most of, of Florida's built over wetlands. Let's be clear here. Um, and that happens to be my alma mater. It's a very interesting study. I started looking into it and I haven't really dived into the entire study. But what I will say is this, uh, there's a tower right now on South Beach, I can tell you, that uh, has undergone significant subsidence. It, it's not uncommon and certainly the rate at which uh, it's not ideal, but it's not uncommon for that to be present. But again, that alone would not indicate that that was the factor uh, that caused this failure. Uh, simply put, 
if they were to notice an inch a year, two inches a year, uh, certainly that would be extremely alarming and it would be uh, reasons for them to likely, you know, vacate the building and undergo investigation. But uh, I would say that while it's not ideal, um, I've heard situations where that is going on in other places in Miami. Building on wetlands, of course, we, you know, most of South Florida was a wetland. We bring in fills. We do geo, uh, geotechnical testing prior to putting these buildings in place. We use pile systems. Um, I'm not sure if this was an auger cast pile or, or a different type of piling system, but certainly a lot of this will be uncovered once uh, they dig through this rubble and we look at everything, including the design plans for the building, um, as well as um, it, the maintenance logs and what they were doing with this 40 year certification. Uh, and the one last thing I'll bring up. Yeah, yeah. Go, ahead. go ahead. The one last thing I want to bring up is 1981. You know, we're talking about a time in Miami where, you know, things were fast moving, fast moving construction. And I hate to say it, and this is not putting anything under the, the, the contractor that was working on it, their engineer that was working on it. We don't know that. We don't want to put any blame on anyone at this point. But what we do want to say is when you have these periods in, in, in cities histories, when you're talking about this rapid expansion, sometimes certain construction and design related uh, items uh, may be overlooked or, you know, certain corners may be cut and we will learn that. But I don't want to make it seem as if right now we have any certainty as to if it was a design issue, a construction issue or just a long term deterioration uh, and perhaps deferred maintenance issue. Yeah. But we will uncover that. And I know we want answers. We all want answers. And I've been talking with my colleagues and we're all looking at the possible uh, modes of failure. But I, I, I am very confident that we're going to learn that this was a confluence of factors, a number of factors that contributed to yeah, this. More than one factor. Asher, thank you for your perspective. Of course. Incredible. Um, we do appreciate it. And we'll Absolutely. be right back.